Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. Peace be upon you all. Welcome to our show discussing different aspects of Ashura during the month of Muharram. Today's topic, we're going to discuss the very important issue of a concept we call Azadari. Um, it has several uh, names given to it and several forms taken. In essence, we're going to discuss how people around the world mourn and commemorate Imam Hussein. All people around the world show different ways of expressing their emotions, be it grief or be it happiness. And Shia Muslims are no different in this. When it comes to mourning the sacrifice of Imam Hussein on Ashura, you will find several ways of commemorating this tragedy. Be it from wearing black, to beating one's chest, or even doing rituals that might draw blood. To discuss these issues, we're going to have our special guest today, Sheikh Abbas Panju and Sayyid Mohsin Shah, to hopefully shed light on these topics. Sheikh, to begin with, we know that one of the 10 furuddin, or 10 acts that we do, is one of them is called Tawalla, which is to show uh, love and nearness to the Prophet and his family. So can you perhaps shed light on how Azadari and how performing such acts of commemorating the death of Imam Hussein um, is a form of tawalla. Sure. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You find that um, much as uh, tawalla is mentioned within the Furu al-Din, uh, tawalla has got its roots inside of Usul al-Din because tawalla and tabarra are attached directly to the concept of imama and the concept of nabuwa. Yes. And there is a difference in understanding the tawalla and tabarra within the frame of usuluddin and tawalla and tabarra within the frame of furuuddin. And uh, hopefully this can be a discussion for another time because of the differences that uh, and the scopes that are involved in both. And you find that this issue of tawalla and tabarra is endorsed by the Holy Prophet himself where on the day of Eid al-Qadir, he stated, Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man ada. This is after the, the, the declaration, man kuntum mawla fahada aliyun mawla. So, wali man wala tawalla wa adi man ada tabarra. Man kuntum mawla fahada aliyun mawla imama. Man kuntum mawla, the one whose master I am, risala nabuwa, which is usuluddin. Fahada Aliyun Mawla, Amirul Mu'mineen, Mawla over here, Imamat, and then Allahumma Wali Man Wala Wa Adi Man Ada is attached to this concept of Suluddin. Taib. If we understand this, expression of grief is something which is endorsed within the Quranic doctrine, within the teachings of the Quran particularly expression of grief over the plight of the Anbiya and the Awliya of Allah subhanahu because wa ta'ala. Because just for you to bounce off this idea, there are sev I'm sure you've heard it too, um, as a public speaker, you see several other communities who kind of frown upon showing emotion mm. and even when someone passes away, after three days, they'll say, you know, okay, enough now, enough. And right. I've always found that it goes almost against our human nature. So it'll be nice for you, as you mentioned, to chronically prove that we can show emotion and grief. Of course, Islam is a religion um, that is there to perfect the intellect. And perfection of the intellect can only be achieved by expression of emotion in the right way. If you shut out the faculty of emotions from a human being, do they remain as human beings? Mm -hmm. No. Robots. Robots. So emotion is that aspect that makes us human. And you find this is why for us within the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt salam, we are not refused to weep upon um, our relatives who have passed away. Yes, there is an extent into which that uh, uh, there are certain boundaries in that you can't, uh, you can't pass them when you're grieving the death of your family members or friends. The awliya and the ambiya are a separate class or a bracket altogether. Okay. But within our normal 
We don't have any restriction. Yes, there is this element of tawakkul ala Allah, to have trust in Allah and to know that th this is our path. But showing emotion per se, absolutely uh, recommended. In fact, particularly when this emotion is attached to Ahlul Bayt, we have a hadith from Imam Sadiq salam, where he says that one of the signs of, the, of our believers, يَفْرَحُونَ لِفَرْحِنَا وَيَحْزَنُونَ لِحُزْنِنَا is that they are happy when we are happy and they are sad and grieved when we are in grief. So the Imam actually says that this is one of the signs of a mu'min that he participates in the happiness of the happiness of Ahlul Bayt and he commemorates the grief which is related to the grief of Ahlul Bayt. Mm. And even more surprising than that, this just came to my mind, within the letters uh, that is written from one of the tawqi of the 12th Imam, Al-Hujja Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, where he says, to paraphrase the wedge, and we are fully aware mm. of the situation of the Shias. Meaning what? That the Imam experiences and participates in our grief as well, mm. and True in way. our happiness as well. So emotion over here is a very powerful tool. It shouldn't be looked down upon. In fact, it's one of the most powerful tools to help man achieve perfection. The emotion that a husband has between with his wife, faculty of love, is from the faculty of emotion. Mm. The love that a person has with his children is from the faculty of love, is the faculty of emotion. So emotion has got its own role in the completion of man and in man reaching the state of perfection. So establishing or establishing the case for display of grief and emotion has multiple levels and has multiple scopes. Expressing grief for the tragedy of Ahlul Bayt is something which is warranted within the seerah of Rasulullah within the seerah of Ahlul Bayt and is a concept which is deeply rooted within the Quran. Mm. And you also find that when it comes to expressing grief, the narrations that we have outline certain examples or methodologies in which grief can be expressed. And then you have hadith that have left the issue of expressing grief as being arm, arm as in general which means that every community can grieve according to their own cultural norms so long as they are within a certain general uh, framework. framework of halal and haram. But Islam, this is one of the beauties of Islam, that it lets people commemorate grief and on the other hand celebrate happiness within their own cultural norms in a manner in which they will be able to relate with Ahlul Bayt yeah. so long as it is within mm -hmm. that wider framework. So Sayyid Mohsen, I'm sure you can relate to this. Growing up uh, in the Shia community, I'm sure on the day of Ashura or the nights preceding, when that time comes where people express their grief, I've witnessed, you witnessed, someone wailing very loudly versus someone wailing, uh, not crying at all. You and I have seen someone beating their chest in the middle of the hall to the poetry versus someone who stands in the back just quietly. You've seen people who maybe do rituals that involve shedding blood versus those who don't. Have you ever thought about equality here in terms of is the person who is outright doing these rituals better than the person standing at the back? How would you, how would you have you thought about this? When I was younger, yes, uh, I was thought, well, well, maybe they don't feel as connected or maybe the tragedy hasn't touched the heart mm. as much as. We've all done, I'm sure, the classic as kids when you go home and check whose chest is redder. <laughs> yes, we have. Yes. Unfortunately, um, but I think as you go older and go wiser, yeah, you understand that people relate to Imam Hussein in different ways. You also understand that people have different ways of expression, expressing their emotions. Some may not be as you know um, extrovert as others, but that doesn't mean that the tragedy has affected them less, or they have 
a weaker relationship with Abu Abdullah Hussein. Yeah. Alayhi salam. I guess it's 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 also a building, uh, a never ending building relationship. This year the person may have been standing on the side. Next year he may be right in the middle. Mm. I know people one year they were bloodletting, the next year they weren't bloodletting. Mm. I guess the main thing that we need to focus on and what we neglect is the knee of the person. And we we always, you know, I, I guess if we if we try to understand the near, that way we won't, you know, misinterpret the integrity mm. of a person's uh, actual intention and their sincerity towards Babil al Hussein and the Aza as well. Yeah, we all do this. We look at the external sometimes mm -hmm. and don't we don't know the internal of the person. You know, some I know some people who are absolutely in love with the Imam, but sometimes they just can't they they can't cry. Sheikh, you talked about crying. Um, now I'm sure you're aware we have this ultra masculine culture um in the current world we live in that you know this phrase real men don't cry mm. and growing up as shia i'm sure we never got that because you're used to seeing a hall of men crying and not just crying but wailing ha can you emphasize the importance of crying as a form of expression in islam what does it do to our heart of course um, you'll find that the concept of crying is something which is praised within the quran and uh, you'll find verses of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, to paraphrase the verse of the Quran, when those who see our signs and they submit to our signs, they fall down in submission and they cry. Yeah. Yani, you will find crying in terms of when a person weeps having thought and contemplated about the grandeur of Allah subhanahu mm. wa ta'ala. In all, in all, this is something that points towards kamal, perfection. When a person weeps and he thinks about the sins that he has committed, and he has wept out of grief and out of shame, to indicate repentance, like what happens when we recite dua kumail many times. Dua kumail is a very dua kumail in itself is a very touching dua. Yeah. Depending on how a person understands the du'a, the munajat of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, you have that these tears that are shed in repentance are tears that show perfection. Mm. See, in one way, the shedding of tears, this is what I believe, the shedding of tears is a proof of the humanity inside of you. Yeah. A person who is not if you don't cry or weep over tragedy, it means you are indifferent to it. So weeping in that sense shows the humanity inside of you. And this is where we start to see, okay, we have got a culture that shows masculinity or portrays masculinity as not having to cry. And then we have a culture that shows masculinity which is not threatened by the fact that you weep. Can you show me a figure in history more masculine than Amir al-Mu'minin mm. alayhi salam? La. Battalion, warrior bima'na al-kalima. Warrior that the world has never seen before. At the same time, this Amir al-Mu'minin, masculine as can be, you find him in the middle of the night, weeping while he's in sujood. Not only weeping in, in, in a state of prayer, we well, have traditions that state during his, uh, when the Zahiri Khilafa, when the apparent leadership was given to him, every time he walked in the streets of Kufa and he saw an orphan, his eyes would fill up with tears. Mm. Softness of the heart. Baba, this is something that requires contemplation. You and I, we see images of orphans on our television screens. Maybe once, maybe twice, we will have tears. Third, fourth time, desensitized. Yeah. Hadith says, every time Amir al-Mu'minin saw an orphan, he wept. How mm. soft must that heart have been? So yes, the tears indicate the humanity inside of you and the softness of the heart, mm. which is something which, which is praiseworthy from within the Quran mm. itself. Let's bring in then Obviously, there are different levels of mourning um, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, peace be upon him. And we're not going to go through all of them, obviously, and, and label and name them. 
But I'm sure, again, living especially in the UK and those of our viewers who live in the West as well, Shia Muslims are almost labelled in a way by doing certain actions. Um, and one Google search will, will show you such things. So, um, Sayyid Mohsen, what kind of, do you think grieving for Imam can go too far? Sheikh talked about framework that we have in place. Where do, you, where, would, where do we draw the line? What is extreme? I don't even like using that word, but what is too much, you could say? And where do we draw the line? Or does this grief have no bounds because of the nature of it? I have to agree with the latter, where I believe that you know, grief has no bounds. Not just grief, but emotion. Yes. And at the time, your emotions will dictate your actions. Um, I understand that there may be, uh, you know, I'm sorry to use the same word, but like a halal haram framework. Yeah. But at the same time, we have seen throughout history different forms of grief, different forms of protest as well. Now, if you remember in, in the, the Arab African uh, peninsula, when there was revolution after revolution and protest after protest, what triggered it was a man setting himself on fire after he had enough mm. of injustice. He had enough that his emotions and his grief and his sorrow took him to an extent where he set himself on fire, which sparked a revolution throughout the whole of the African uh, Arab uh, Peninsula. Mm. The same way with the Azar of Abu Abdullah Hussein, his death and his sacrifice sparks an emotion in us. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Sheikh, but doesn't the, the, the scriptures say that if you were to know the truth about Karbala mm. and, and the real Masaib, the man would die from grief. Oh, that it is so tragic. Ahsan. So if a man is to die from, and this is like the, the this is what the hadith said, the scriptures say, mm. as in this is expected that you are to die if you knew the truth. Mm. So how far can I, how can you put a boundary on that? I mean, I've I've even heard, and whether it's true or not, that what we're told in the pulpit, there's stuff that's hidden from us on purpose, out of fear that those who hear it may even you know harm themselves too much to the extent they might die. So what we know is a portion, isn't it, compared to what actually happened, Indeed. what what was witnessed on that day. Um, and it, you, what you said reminds me, there's a, um, I'm, I'm a teacher, I teach religion, and I use this piece of art um, in my lessons on Ashura. And it was by an Italian painter um, in the late 1800s, I believe. Um, he was in Istanbul, and he, he, he witnesses people, he happened to be on the, on the day of Ashura, and he witnesses people dressed in white and striking their, their heads with swords. And he caught, I remember, he, he drew the image and it was, it's, it's a very, although some might call it haunting, it seems a very beautiful piece of art. Um, and he says that when I saw this procession, I wanted to know who they were mourning about. And this brings us to this topic of the symbols mm -hmm. of Sha'ir of Imam Hussein, yeah. peace be upon him, and how we uphold these symbols and the rituals that we do. And now you're bringing you both in here to contribute, uh, please, is what have the, the, the Holy Family, the Prophet's family, and himself, peace be upon them all, taught us about upholding these symbols of Imam Hussein? Of course. Um, you find that upholding the Sha'air of uh, Imam al Hussein, uh, alayhi salam, you have uh, Imam al Sadiq, alayhi wa salam, who says, Rahimallah, Ahyu Amrana, Rahimallah, man Ahya Amrana. May the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompass those who revive our affairs. Reviving the affairs from is a very broad category, which includes in particular the affairs of Imam al Hussein, and from within the affairs of Imam al Hussein, reviving by narrating the tragedy of Imam al Hussein, the weeping of Imam al Hussein, the beating of the chest, and the ziyara, and the self flagellation, and so on and so forth. And we have a number of hadith that speak about the importance of, uh, of these acts and these symbols and where they originated from. So for example, you'll be surprised. The latam, the classical act of latam that we have, or what we call matam in the uh, subcontinent, beating of the chest. The beating of the chest is a practice whose validity emanates from the actions of the women of Ahlul Bayt yes. from the Sabah and Karbala where they would beat their 
cheeks and you have even beating of the cheeks until this day and age so where did this emanate from it emanates particularly from them and just so that you know we we, we encourage this culture of uh, of researching things academically and citing whatever stances we take with proof fact that's based. important fact base let me uh, narrate this one uh, hadith for you. It's narrated by Sheikh Atusi in uh, Al Tahdib. Tahdib, Kitab Al Tahdib, is one of our four major books when it comes to uh, Shia literature. Hadith is narrated on authority of Imam Sadiq salam, where he talks about the women. And he says, And they struck their cheeks out of grief for Hussein ibn Ali, and it is upon the likes of him, Hussein ibn Ali, that the cheeks should be struck. Should, so, be. should be struck. So you find that hitting the cheeks out of grief, if it is permissible to hit the cheek, then oh, it becomes awla, or it is a matter of common sense that it is permissible to mm -hmm. hit the chest. Didn't Sarah, wife of Prophet Ibrahim salam, also in the Quran strike her face when she was when it found out she was pregnant and Allah did not condemn her for it? Of course, Ahsantum. So we have many cases like these that are there. Uh, we have proof that derives the validity of this. When it comes to the validity of the different mannerisms that we have, we have the hadith, for example, there's a beautiful text known as Kamil al yes. authored by Ibn Kawlaway, where it speaks about the reward of crying yes. and the reward of the ziyara of Imam al Hussein. So these are all manners or these are all symbols, different symbols from the symbols of Imam al Hussein Shah'ar al Husseiniyah. And uh, what is important, see, understanding the validity of this and delving into Islamic texts to find the root of these practices is not something that is difficult. There's information and knowledge that is available to everybody. However, in my opinion, something which is a bit more challenging, more contemporary when it comes to Azadari is this. Living in the 21st century, in the West, performing Azadari in all its different scales or in its different intensities, something that is perhaps not really understood. Does it give Islam a negative image? Does it give us the image that we are backward people? Yes. Does it give us the image of we are violent people? Mm. We need to answer and understand the Azadari through concepts like these in this day and age. How practical is it? Uh, are the allegations that are put towards us allegations worth paying attention to or mm. not? Are they allegations that are purposely created or stirred in the media in order to detract you? Absolutely. And this has happened in the past. It's not just theory, hitchim in al hawa, we just brought it up. La, these, are, these are schemes that were actually plotted and planned and we have seen this happen mm. over the years. Um, even even uh, inside of uh, Iraq during the Ba'athist times yes. and even during the time of Iraq, in, the ti in Iran during the time of the Shah, these were arguments that were put forward. Uh, Pahlavi the second Shah, he used to come out and one of the mannerisms in which, in addition to banning the Mawakib of Azadari, is that he used to put forward this thing and push people within the government to say that these acts of Azadari portray us to be a nation that is backward. Mm. Look at the weaponry that is being used. When you cannot physically stop somebody from commemorating the Aza of Imam al Hussein, you can't attack them to stop them. What do you do? You break their willpower, you break their morality, you create within them an inferiority complex Absolutely. that makes them back away from their faith. Almost like we have to please you. Because see, it is human psychology that nobody wants to be isolated. You want to feel the sense of belonging to the wider human nation community or whatever it is in that sense. So it's important for us to understand Azadari from this perspective yes. in the sense does weeping give us a bad image or not? In the small for the time that we have. Many times the concerns that are there against Azadari 
in terms of it gives us a negative image or a violent image, regardless of whether it is from the latum all the way to the bloodletting. How do we answer back? How do we deal with questions like these that have been asked? And these are contemporary issues. Mm -hmm. See, the first thing is the definition of violence. Violence is when you exert force or compel somebody else. <laughs> it's not when you exert force or compel yourself. <laughs> Violence is when it is practiced on somebody else. Mm -hmm. And we don't have in our faith where anybody is forced to do azadari or mm -hmm. one forces his azadari on somebody else in that sense. Number two is that, Habibi, our faith, we have always been the victims. For 1400 years we have been victims, until today we are victims. You will not find a single case in Shia history where our theology, where our theology endorses violence upon others. The best way to understand the issue or to be able to reply back to the Azadari, one of the best ways, if not, no, I shouldn't even say best ways, one of the ways of replying back is that, particularly when it comes to bloodletting, is that this is an act which is supposed to symbolize self-sacrifice. I am ready to sacrifice myself for the Imam of my time. Had I been in Karbala, I would have placed my body in front of the body of the Imam. When you come out in a mawkib of Azadari, to the outside world, it is supposed to reflect that you, as a peace-loving individual throughout the year who condemns violence, you are coming out on this day to show the outside world that I am ready to give my life for the principles that preserve the goodness of humanity. Mm -hmm. Because this is what Imam al Hussein did. Imam al Hussein did he come out for the Shias only? Law. No. Did he come out for the Muslims only? Law. Did he only for the Christians, only for the Jews? No. He came out to save, to guide humanity. And you are coming out in Azadari to say that I am willing to give my life for that person who stands for the whole of humanity. And in the same way, I also stand for the whole of humanity and I'm willing to give my life for these principles that ensure the goodness of humanity on its own. And you find the understanding changes altogether. The perception from the people on the other side changes altogether. This is one. Number two, it is about an expression of love. Mm. If I had been there, I would have sacrificed myself. And you find that this is not only particular to us. You find that even within the Christian school of thought, and even though they may be a minority, there are those who replicate the crucifixion Indeed. on Good Friday. And they themselves experience pain by crucifying themselves. To empathize. To empathize. Ah, sons. Does it mean that these are a people who are violent, backward, savage? No. Mm. Normal people shop owners, mm -hmm. you student in university, mm -hmm. family men mm -hmm. who live a normal peaceful life but because of the intensity of their love mm -hmm. and they want to feel the pain of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. they carry out in the same thing. And truthfully speaking, it's a language of love. Yeah, I think um, we're going to wrap up very, very soon. I think a very nice way to wrap up is this it is an act of love, no matter what you perceive of it, it's an act of love. So, Morrison, I'll let you have the, the, the final word. In a sense, I want you to, and this may maybe quite a personal question, is any act of azadari that you may perform without naming, you doing it, how does it make you feel? Performing acts of azadari. Any it, act of mourning. Whether it is to dress in black, to attend majalis, to beat my chest, or to, or to cry for a man, I'm saying, or to the bloodlet gives me uh, a sense of direction, a sense of the reality of my existence and the reality of the existence of the Imam of our time, 
for we will be we will be called upon to you know sacrifice our lives for the Imam. So we I know we we dedicate Muharram to Imam Hussein and and it's all about reviving his message and his memory, hundred percent. But let us not forget that there's a big battle for our Imam of our time, and we need to show that Imam that we are ready to sacrifice our blood for him and his cause. And inshallah, with everyone, the, the Azadari can help reinforce that notion and reinforce that relationship with the Imam of their time, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you to our dear guests for shedding light on this very important topic. Thank you to our dear viewers at home watching from across the world. It's clear to see that expressing any grief for the Imam or any holy personality is a, a, a letter and an act of love. And as it was mentioned, there is no doubt within the Shia school of thought we are commanded to and must commemorate the memory of Imam Hussein. How you do it depends upon your culture and how you choose to express yourself and it's between them and God. But in the end, we must also look at the boundaries that God has set us. Thank you, dear viewers, and we hope you, jo uh, we hope you join us next time for the next discussion. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah.